Hello and welcome to the Nebraska City Museum of Firefighting, where they're dedicated to interpreting the oldest fire department in the state of Nebraska. I'm Lance Schwartz, inviting you to sit back and relax. We're going to spend the next 30 minutes exploring our town, Nebraska City. Located about 50 miles east of Lincoln, our town, Nebraska City, is the county seat of Oto County and the home of more than 7,200 residents. The year was 1804. Lewis and Clark climbed up out of the Missouri River and first stepped foot on the land that a half century later would become Nebraska City. Today, they're home to 11 different museums. So needless to say, they do appreciate their long and colorful past right here in our town, Nebraska City. There were about three communities along the Missouri River who in uh, incorporated about the same time and we say Nebraska City is the oldest. There is some paperwork at the uh, Capitol building in Lincoln that shows that Nebraska City was the first incorporated community in the state. Tammy Parch is a historian who was raised in Nebraska City. Welcome to Arbor Lodge Mansion, the home of Jay Sterling Morton, the founder of Arbor Day. Tammy says this magnificent 52-room neoclassical mansion sits in the middle of 72 acres of wooded rolling hills. When Jay Sterling Morton arrived in Nebraska City in 1855, this was a treeless prairie. He saw the potential for boundless trees and a place for people to live and call home. Nebraska City residents are really proud of our history. Because of our history and because of the tourism, because of the orchards and the festivals that we have and the community involvement, we are here and we are thriving. Can you tell Tammy works for the Chamber of Commerce? After all, Nebraska City is a city so great they named a state after it. And it's also so great that one Nebraska City man has decided to lead a crusade of sorts as he's uncovered the long lost history of every building in downtown Nebraska City. Well, there was a one time when uh, we, on Sunday mornings I'd come down and paint the public restrooms because they needed painting and volunteer work. And uh, every time I would look across the street at the keeping room, I could read their lips. They said the same thing. It's like, I wonder what this building used to be. And just like that, Jim Coon was on a mission to dig out the dusty records of downtown Nebraska City. What was it about this project that just made you want to dig in and record all of this great history? Uh, pride in community. I mean, it's basically what it is. I've been in Nebraska City for 27 years or so, and a lot of people say, well, you have such a long, wonderful Main Street. You know, what, what, what were some of the buildings? What's their history? Oftentimes, it's not easy to compile a hundred years of history on a building that 20 businesses have called home. There's a lot of information. I've crawled through attics, basements, garages, pulling out old pictures, magazines, and newspapers. So. It, it takes a while to do all that. Then you got to scan it and organize it. And so it all takes time. Jim says he and his Main Street Historians Committee are now starting to hand out the history information posters to each individual store owner. And we're going to try to do 30 or 40 at a time, and that might take till the rest of the year. All in all, this history junkie says they will probably end up telling the stories of anywhere from 200 to 250 buildings on Nebraska City's Central Avenue. It is pretty cool to drive down up and down Main Street and know what most of the buildings were and why there's a big vacancy like a parking lot because there used to be a hotel there and there was a big fire. So I love my building and I'm really excited about learning more. Kelly Beckett is a proud downtown property owner who appreciates the work done by Jim and his committee. We have history and we like other people to learn it but it also helps our business economy too so we're grateful. I'm grateful and I think every other business is grateful too. So. Bottom line, Jim's love for Our Town Nebraska City makes all of the exhaustive research he's done over the past three years well worth it. There's always something interesting. It's just uh, it amazes me. And something else that amazes me is all of the impressive murals that adorn many of the buildings in downtown Nebraska City. This one was a two summer process. Kent Schwartz was living in Omaha 11 years ago, looking for a good place to raise his kids. We just came here one day and people were so friendly and nice and so we moved. And shortly thereafter, Kent started giving the old red brick buildings in downtown Nebraska City a coat of paint like they'd never had before. They saw an old, uh, the Cremo cigar ad, and it was between the buildings. So 
Nobody had seen it until the building fell down. The Worth Foundation paid Kent to restore this Cremo ad. And then after we did that one, then we did the cell shoes, and it just kept going after that. Kent has got this mural making thing down to a science. So you just got to measure the wall, you got to scale it out, start designing it, make sure everybody likes what it is, what it looks like. It turns out that larger than life painting runs in Kent's family. Well, my dad, he was a sign painter, and so he did a lot of signs back in Columbus. So whenever we go back to Columbus, you can still see his stuff up on the walls or businesses still around, you know. Like his father, Kent enjoys making his mark on a town and preserving its history. Yeah, the Zip Baking Company was here originally, and I found old pictures with the uh, delivery uh, wagons in front of it. I've never seen an artist out there doing business ads like I've done here. Unfortunately, Kent is his worst critic. So on such a grand scale, it's, it's really hard because if you don't like it, it, it takes forever to, to repaint. Kent gets a thrill out of brightening the world around him. Very enjoyable, you know, unless you're in the sun all day. But uh, it's great. People stop and talk, and we, they give their input, and they're very appreciative. And so, yeah, it is very nice. He has preserved Nebraska City. Jackie Smith is a big fan of the mural man. It preserved the past brought things to, to life again that we all remember who, who were born and raised here. So we're so fortunate to have Kent and for him to be sticking around and, and finding more empty walls for us. And if you're talking about nostalgic here in downtown Nebraska City, you absolutely must talk about the man who has become a fixture here over the past seven decades. The building itself was built in 1869 for the purpose of a hardware store. That's all it's ever been. Walt Wenzel is a walking encyclopedia of Nebraska City knowledge. I was born in Nebraska City. And he loved it so much, he never left. The people of Nebraska City have all have been good to me. Walt started working at J.R. Hausner's hardware store in 1943 when he was just 15 years old. Wenzel's, good morning. Walt graduated from St. Bernard's High School in 1946. My wife is my schoolgirl sweetheart. We were married in 48. I'd like to have you meet my wife of 68 years. This is Rita, Rita Wenzel. She's been my partner in life and partner in the store for that many years. Together, Walt and Rita had six children and they all worked in the store at one time or another. This is the oldest one, that's Teresa. You might wonder how a guy survives in the hardware business for 73 years. Well, Walt's got two solid reasons. Um, I guess uh, mostly Rita, <laughs> my guardian angel, and uh, just the friendly people who come in the store. People like 97-year-old Herb Wickhorst, who's been visiting Walt at the hardware store since the year Walt got started, 1943. Oh, and he does a wonderful job. Always has. You bet. Walt has no employees, so if he's not there, the store is closed. I'm 88. Walt. You I'm just a kid. Well, this kid has had quite a career in downtown Nebraska City. A lot of my old customers are out at Waiuka Cemetery, so I've lost them. I'd like to have some new ones. Walt is away from the store and on dialysis three days a week, but he has no plans of retiring. Walt has no plans to retire. <laughs> he even put it in writing. That's true. I suppose they'll carry me out of here sometime <laughs> on the stretcher or, or, or the hearse will come pick me up. Walt has dedicated his career to taking care of his loyal customers. It's been my life. Thanks for coming. We appreciate it very much. I hope the next time you come, you buy something. And shortly after Walt said that, his wife explained, he's ornery. What a memorable man. As I was leaving, Walt patted me on the back. He shook my hand and he said, we're friends for life. What a guy, what a career. Straight ahead, we'll meet an ultra competitive woman that is bound to inspire you as she prepares to compete in the Paralympics. Stay tuned.
Welcome back to Our Town, Nebraska City. I'm your tour guide, Lance Schwartz. 20 years ago, Sherry Madsen was one of the best wheelchair racers in the world. She retired in 2000, but she has since returned to the track looking for more Paralympic medals. When I was three years old, I woke up from a nap and couldn't walk. Um, just, they kind of just diagnosed me as an unknown virus. That's Sherry on the left. Despite her disability, this young lady was always on the go. Sherry got her start in wheelchair racing in 1994 in Wichita, Kansas. That was the first time I'd ever seen a racing frame, and I borrowed Jim Martinson's chair. It was a man's chair that didn't fit her, but it worked out pretty well. I got on the track, and I ended up beating pretty much every person there, and since then I've never stopped. Sherry's need for speed propelled her around the world, earning precious medals at every stop. I participated at the Olympics in Atlanta, and I won a bronze medal. And so I am the first Native American female ever to win an Olympic bronze. So that's always been really cool. I'm in the Smithsonian. I'm in their video for Native Americans. So that was a really good experience. It was in 1996 when Sherry broke the world record in the 400 meters. Coming out of 96, I had five medals, and I really started concentrating then on 2000 because I wanted more world records and I wanted gold medals. And Sherry got some gold medals at the Sydney, Australia Games. Yeah, so it was a really good experience. So after 2000, I retired. I, yeah, I can't, I felt like I was kind of going out, you know, on the top of my game. Three world records, two gold medals, like, I was pretty excited about that, and I wanted to get married and start a family. Sherry accomplished that as well. She got married in 01, and then she had two beautiful daughters. But 13 years after she retired, the need to compete returned. And now, even in her late 30s, Sherry just keeps getting better and better. This time around, I've actually I've surpassed my times that I had. I know it's amazing. Sherry's been training six days a week and three hours a day, and she's confident that she will be contending for a medal in Rio. I'm excited, super excited, and part of this too is it's showing my girls like, you know, they can do anything they want to do if they put their mind to it. <laughs> Sherry is very proud to be a 1995 graduate of Nebraska City High School. Oh, Nebraska City is the best community. They are so supportive. On the doorstep of her 40th birthday, Sherry leaves for Rio tomorrow, and the Paralympic Games will begin on September 7th. And speaking of determined people, Sherry lives among a lot of them right here, people who have been encouraged by a leadership program that was started in 2005. Leadership Nebraska City has been an integral part of Nebraska City for 11 years. And Melissa year Turner should know. She's the Leadership Nebraska. Nebraska City Program Chairman. Every year we have a class of people that go through the program to learn leadership skills, to develop self-confidence, to learn about Nebraska City and learn about all of the options and opportunities in Nebraska City to serve. And then Leadership Nebraska City connects them with those opportunities so they can serve on boards, volunteer for organizations, and play a part in the decisions that are made in Nebraska City. Over the past 11 years, more than 90 people have taken part in Leadership Nebraska City, and those alumni are now serving on more than 70 different boards. Well, the year was 1903. A man by the name of George Craigle established a business to manufacture windmills right here in downtown Nebraska City. It doesn't take too much imagination to transport yourself back in time to the day more than a century ago when this building was full of hardworking men constructing giant machines that were built to harness the wind. At this factory, they built approximately 1,000 windmills. Most of their production was done between 1903 and 1941. David Flatt is the executive director of the Craigle Windmill Factory Museum. They quit full production due to World War II because there was a scarcity of metals and there was metal rationing. After World War II, they built Eli windmills only by demand. They built their last windmill actually in 1983. David says the Craigle company didn't make a lot of money just building windmills. The biggest part of their business 
was the repair of windmills. So they would not only repair the Eli windmills, but also from other companies, such as Dempster, uh, located in Beatrice, and for Aeromotor, which was the largest national windmill manufacturer. Across the street from the museum, visitors will see one of the original Eli's. That is their standard one that they built a thousand of. It has a 30 foot tower with a 10 foot blade span. David says out of the thousand all steel windmills that they built, there's only about 130 of those left standing today. And most of them you would find within a 30 to 50 mile a radius of Nebraska City. This building sat empty for 17 years as Nebraska City raised $1.7 million for its renovation. The museum opened up in the spring of 2013. It's interesting to note that there is just one windmill factory museum in the entire United States and it's located right here in our town Nebraska City. Coming up, we'll find out why Our Town Nebraska City is the Apple capital of Nebraska. Stick around, we'll be right back. Welcome back to Our Town, Nebraska City. I'm Lance Schwartz. For many Nebraskans, the words Nebraska City are synonymous with the words Applejack Festival. It's the mother of all fruit-based festivals in the state. And over the past 48 years, this kickoff of the apple harvest has become a Nebraska City tradition. Kind of one of those made-up holidays. Tammy Parch is in charge of marketing for Nebraska City Tourism and Commerce. We have a lot of orchards in the area. We have historically had a lot of orchards in the area. And a way to bring tourists to town is to have a big festival. And this most definitely could be classified as a big festival. Each September, between 60 and 80,000 people invade our town Nebraska City in search of all things apple. You can come and get fresh apples and cider and maybe some pie. And it has evolved in the last 48 years to now we have cookouts and a parade and a fun run and pancake feed and a carnival and a car show. Just, just something for everybody throughout the entire weekend. This year, the 48th Applejack Festival will be taking place on a three-day weekend, September 16th through the 18th. We celebrate Applejack because the apples are in harvest in there and it's time for you to come and pick your own apples and we've turned that celebration into a whole kickoff to all the fun things that happen in Nebraska City for the fall. Amy Allgood is the Executive Director for Nebraska City Tourism and Commerce and a Nebraska City native. So you better believe she knows all of the delightful ways that apples can be prepared. We have caramel apples, candied apples, apple pie. My favorite is an apple slushy. Oh, there's apple donuts. Apple donuts. Oh my gosh, apple pie a la mode. So it's a great time to experience the picking of the apple and all the things that you can do with the fruit. The apple donuts are kind of amazing. They are a gift from God himself. And Tammy thinks it's fun to teach kids about where the most important ingredient of an apple donut comes from. For the younger generation, coming to an orchard and picking your own apples and bringing your kids to do that is a very natural thing, and it's very popular now. 
The theme of the festival this year is, what's your apple tradition? My family goes and gets caramel apples every year on the Thursday before Applejack. I've been to every Applejack parade since I was born, I think. Nebraska City's Applejack Festival will get underway in just three weeks. And one of the places you'll need to make sure and visit is the historic Kimmel Orchard and Vineyard, who just celebrated their 90th anniversary. Richard and Lorraine Kimmel started the orchard in 1925, um, primarily just growing apples and cherries at that point. Aaron Beathy is a manager at Kimmel Orchard. As things expanded and grew, um, the offerings became a little bit larger, trying to expand the season all the way from spring until apple harvest in the fall. At the Kimmel Orchard, they prefer to make it a hands-on experience. One of the major things that we do here is our you pick, where guests can come out and pick their own fruit. Um, that's a major draw for a lot of families just because they like the experience of being able to come on to the farm per se, I guess, and get the experience of coming to pick apples or pick the other fruits that we have. Kimmel is known far and wide for their apples, but Aaron says they are very proud of the wide variety of fruit they grow in their orchard. We have strawberries, cherries, peaches, blackberries, Asian pears, plums, and then our primary crop being apples. Um, we do have acres of grapes for our wine as well. Kimmel planted their first grapes in 2000 and had their first harvest in 2004. And then ever since then we've been selling wine here at the orchard. Um, we do have 12 different varieties, five whites, four reds, and then we do have our fruit wines as well. We're pretty much at the tail end of our peach harvest. Tyler Bach is the we, orchard uh, manager, and he's peaches. in charge of much Picking more than here. just uh, apples. We grow about seven acres of peaches out here. Uh, they're mostly the Flame and Fury cultivars, so they're nice, juicy ones, big ones, bigger than softballs in most cases, so that's good for us out here. So over here we've got some of our newer uh, model trees. As apple harvest gets started next week, Tyler invites visitors to come out and pick some fruit and receive a free education about apples. There's a lot of labor that goes into it. Uh, we get to show our customers, our guests, um, the pride that we put into our orchard, all the hard work throughout, you know, the 10 other months that we're not just harvesting those, that typical fr or whatever fruit it is. It's kind of nice to be able to show off to the public what we work so hard to do. And it's, um, it's pretty rewarding at the end of the year too. Aaron and Tyler say you don't need to wait until the Applejack Festival to come out and visit them. Head out to Kimmel Orchard from now through November. Coming up in our final segment, there's a hospital in our town, Nebraska City, that doesn't just treat bodies. They take care of hearts, minds, and spirits. Stay tuned. Welcome back to Our Town, Nebraska City, the home of a beautiful new 110,000 square foot, $50 million hospital that includes an integrated clinic and increased capacity for specialty clinics. 
We opened a brand new campus in Nebraska City in October of 2014. And it's one of the most beautiful hospitals in the country. But for us, it's much, much more than just the traditional health care. Dan Kelly has been the president in Nebraska City's St. Mary's Hospital for the past two decades. I can get you in to see the doctor. I can get you in to have an x-ray. I can get you in to have surgery. But to really take care of you, we have to take care of all of you. Dan decided to take direction from the past as he carefully planned the hospital's future. What's sitting here on my right is a picture of the old St. Mary's Chapel. It was built in 1939 by a group of very dedicated women religious to show everybody that we are taking care of the whole person. And we felt we owed it to those women religious, all the people that we have taken care of over the years to continue that tradition. So we did something that most health care providers don't do in this day and age. They built a full-blown Catholic church inside the hospital. To show that our dedication to that mission that's, that's guided us for the last 90, 90 years and it's going to guide us for the next 90 years. The original St. Mary's played a role in each step of the new chapel's design. We made the decision to go the extra distance and create this and make it a fully designated functioning Catholic church. This chapel was commissioned by Bishop Connolly and is used daily. Well, you know, you, you, you look at the rest of the building, the rest of the hospital, the rest of the clinic, anybody can do that. Not everybody can do this. Dan says he is very serious about his mission at the CHI Health St. Mary's. The custom stained glass window that we did inside the new chapel is, of course, is the, that's the Good Shepherd image. And I can't think of a better image to reflect a health care provider than the Good Shepherd, because that's really the business we're in, is taking care of everyone out there, heart, body, mind, and spirit. Well, that's going to do it for our memorable journey around our town, Nebraska City. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. For everyone at 1011 News, I'm Lance Schwartz. So long, everybody.